you know, the, the, the digital euro is going to have a limited amount of control. There will be control. You're right. You're completely right. Mm -hmm. We are considering whether for very small amounts, you know, anything that is around 300, 400 euros, we could have a mechanism where there is zero control. But that could be dangerous. Здравствуйте, ребята. Европарламент одобрил первое в мире крипторегулятивное законодательство. Отличная новость, которую мы столько лет ждали от Соединенных Штатов. Но есть кое-что, что многие упускают за таким громким событием. И они уже готовят нам сюрпризы. К сожалению, не очень приятные. Но прежде чем мы перейдем к контенту, не забудь поставить лайк. На прошлых видео мы набирали по 4-5 тысяч лайков, что очень круто. Именно поэтому я выпускаю обновления по криптовалюте и экономике каждый день. Итак, в Европе появился целый ряд новых законов, которые прячутся под оберткой всеобъемлющего регулирования криптовалюты, наличных денег и цифровых активов. Вот, например, один из них. Если ты рискнешь оплатить что-либо на сумму более 1000 евро наличными, ты рискуешь загреметь за решение. Шотку. И если ты думаешь, что из-за того, что ты не живешь в Европе, тебя это обойдет стороной, ты ошибаешься. Это будет во всех странах мира рано или поздно. Несколько недель назад, в марте, Европейский Союз ввел новые лимиты наличных платежей в размере 7000 евро, или же около 7500 долларов. Этот порог разнится по всей Европе. Например, во Франции и Италии новый лимит наличных платежей составляет всего 1000 евро, или же 1100 долларов. Кроме ограничений на наличные, существует новое ограничение на анонимные криптовалютные переводы свыше 1000 евро. Также с каждым обновлением законов мы можем увидеть, что эти лимиты становятся все меньше и меньше. Недавно кто-то разыграл Кристин Лагард, председателя Европейского Центрального Банка, притворившись Владимиром Зеленским президентом Украины. Пранк вылился в очень интересный инсайт о том, что готовится в Европе в плане будущего денег и граждан. Конечно же, в других странах будет все то же самое, плюс-минус. В этом видеозвонке мы можем найти интереснейшую цитату. Мы думаем, что для очень небольших сумм, например, от 300 до 400 евро, у нас может быть механизм с нулевым контролем, но это все равно будет опасно. Атаки на Францию 10 лет назад полностью финансировались такими очень маленькими анонимными платежами. К сожалению, это видео везде удаляется, скорее всего, официальными властями или банкирами, и найти его достаточно тяжело. В интернете, если что-то и осталось, то в крайне плохом качестве. Это и есть шаги к безналичному обществу, обществу цифровых валют. В настоящее время 114 стран по всему миру активно исследуют и тестируют свои ЦВЦБ. Полгода назад я смотрел на эту карту, и она по большей части была белой. Теперь белых пятен на карте становится меньше. Эти 114 стран вместе представляют 95% мирового ВВП. И если мы посмотрим на веб-сайт Европейского парламента то увидим, что новые лимиты на операции с наличными были введены в качестве мер по борьбе с отмыванием денег и финансированием терроризма. То есть они выставляют себя как спасителя. Они спасают тебя от всех этих угроз. Здесь говорится, что все организации, такие как банки, управляющие активами и криптоактивами, а также агенты по недвижимости, как в физическом, так и в виртуальном мире, и даже высокопоставленные профессиональные футбольные клубы и так далее, и так далее, и так далее, должны будут проверять личности своих клиентов, чем они владеют и кто контролирует компанию, а затем они должны будут передавать эту информацию в центральный реестр. Здесь же написано, чтобы ограничить транзакции с наличными и криптоактивами, депутаты Европарламента хотят ограничить платежи, которые могут приниматься лицами, предоставляющими товары или услуги, то есть продавцов. В том же видео, которое я упоминал ранее, Кристин Лагард прокомментировала, что она ожидает, что Евросоюз примет решение о внедрении цифрового евро уже этой осенью. Во внутренних документах парламента мы можем обнаружить и поэтапный график внедрения цифрового евро. И как мы видим в запуске цифра евро уже достигнут значительный прогресс. Каждый квартал, начиная со второго 2022 года, добавляет кирпичик в эту постройку. В третьем квартале этого года, то есть уже осенью, они собираются принять решение о запуске цифрового евро, о запуске цифровой эры, о запуске цифрового концлагеря. 
Европейский Центральный Банк также сообщил, что он разрабатывает приложение для пользователей и QR-код для совершения платежей. Без этого QR-кода платежи совершить не получится. На самом деле, работа над этим ведется уже годами, просто мало кто об этом знает и мало кто это замечает. Также Евробанк опубликовал краткое описание того, как именно они планируют развернуть цифровой евро. Это будет два этапа. Мы видим, что с помощью цифрового евро пользователи смогут завершать покупки в режиме онлайн, платить налоги, получать социальную помощь, использовать для транзакций в физических магазинах. Эта диаграмма показалась мне интересной, поэтому я показываю ее и тебе. Оказывается, они планируют два этапа принятия цифра евро. Первый этап исключительно фокусируется на p 2 p торговле и электронной коммерции. Второй этап называется «Остальные случаи использования». Это имеет смысл, потому что p 2 p система позволит привлечь большее количество граждан в новую цифровую систему, даст им возможность делать покупки онлайн, что является одним из приоритетов электронной коммерции. Вот что будет удерживать людей в системе цифрового евро. Внедрение цифрового евро, доллара, рубля и других цифровалют ускоряется частично благодаря тому факту, что тестовая версия цифрового юаня уже была запущена. Западные страны, такие страны как Россия, Украина, Беларусь и другие еще не запустили свои аналоги ЦВЦБ. Поэтому они резонно опасаются, что чем больше времени им потребуется для запуска, тем большую долю рынка они потеряют. Так что я могу осторожно предположить, что большая часть работы по запуску цифровых валют основных юрисдикций мира уже завершен. Это объясняет, почему процесс продвигается вперед так агрессивно, так быстро и без каких-либо реальных препятствий. Единственное реальное и самое большое препятствие для них – это, конечно же, общественность. Встретить поддержку внедрения цифрового концлагеря удается редко. Например, опрос двух с половиной тысяч взрослых резидентов Великобритании для политика показал, что только 24% считают, что цифровой фунт может принести больше пользы, чем вреда. Также были проведены опросы, которые показали, что наибольшую озабоченность вызывает, конечно же, конфиденциальность платежей и не только для людей в Европе, но и в США и в России и других странах. Однако, несмотря на то, что широкая общественность не в восторге от цифровых валют и последствий, которые они принесут людям, например, невозможность использования наличных денег, мы видим, что каждый день прогресс разработки внедрения ускоряется. Далее, я хочу, чтобы ты послушал это большое видео. Да, оно некачественное. Я максимально попробовал улучшить его качество, но другого просто-напросто не найти. Правительства удаляют это видео постоянно, и бесконечное число перезаливов сильно попортили смотрибельность. Но поверь мне, ты не пожалеешь. Если его посмотришь, это большой инсайт того, что нас всех ожидает в будущем и ради чего мы покупаем биткоин. Почему мы ищем альтернативу, чтобы быть свободными? Economic situation in Europe, but um, you know that as assistance to Ukraine depends on it, and some countries are already openly saying that internal problems are more important to them than uh, Ukraine. So I just would like to ask you how the things in Europe as a whole, how did the crisis hit? Uh, so what is your position? Where we have an issue is on inflation because of the bottlenecks that have survived the end of COVID, we are seeing prices that have initially gone up only in the area of energy and then gradually mm. through fertilizers in particular to food and now on a much broader basis. So the inflation that we had hoped would be transitory has continued much longer than thought and at a much higher level than expected. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, all central banks and the ECB is no exception, have to take measures in order to reduce inflation so that people do not suffer from high prices and we have a more stable uh, economy. As a result, we have started raising interest rates which you know, were negative, minus mm. 50 basis points uh, about a year ago, and which are now at uh, 2% for the most uh, frequently used uh, 
interest rates. So mm -hmm. we have growth that is low. We have prices mm -hmm. that are too high that we have to bring down. That's, that's the situation that we have at the moment. Why do you think um, uh, how Russia was able to overcome, overcome the sanctions policy? I'm told the sanctions are hitting the European economy and the euro, uh, I think, more than we expect, expected. And um, so are the sanctions working or is Europe uh, shooting itself in the foot? Russia's GDP has grown. It is uh, now the ninth in the world. How do you assess the policy of um, uh, Central Bank of Russia and uh, head of uh, Russia's um, uh, central bank, Elvira Nabiulina, they managed uh, to save the rubble. And why How? Why do you think so? I think Elvira, uh, whom I know well, uh, is a very good uh, central bank governor. She very quickly understood what the situation was and she increased interest rates massively. Mm. And that was at the time the right response in order to make sure that inflation was not going to go through the roof and in order to make sure that people who had invested in Russia, essentially Russians, would keep mm. the money in Russia. So mm. she managed that very well in the early days. And as a result of that, inflation went up, but not very much, and went back down again. So she did a magnificent job. I have no, you know, no hesitation to say that. Mm. I do think that the sanctions are biting, not as much as we had expected, true. Mm -hmm. And I also think that the technological barriers that are, are, that are now imposed on Russia will also have an effect on their growth and on their business model. The problem, with the energy prices, as I see it, and I'm not an energy expert, is that they still manage to sell a lot of the energy, whether it is oil or whether it is gas, to other countries than those countries that apply the sanctions. And certainly outside of the European Union, when they sell to India, when they sell to China, when mm -hmm. they sell to the Far East, well, <laughs> they, they, they manage to get uh, currencies in, and I don't know whether they get renminbi, whether they get uh, rupees or what, but they certainly manage to sell and to bring money in. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, uh, how do you think the position of, e of the EU about uh, COP for oil price, uh, for, uh, for Russian oil? So will it help really? Are you, are you talking about the $60 cap? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, yes, I think it, it will help if it is properly implemented and enforced. Mm. Now, it, I think that all the big insurance companies, all the, the brokers, all the shipping companies uh, that are operating out of Europe, out of the United Kingdom, out of the United States, will respect the, mm. uh, the, the, the cap and will not provide insurance and will not provide shipping if prices are set higher than that. But mm -hmm. you and I know that uh, the Russians are very good at circumventing and you know, moving around the sanctions. Mm. And the mm. fact that he has accumulated um, vessels, um, mm. you know, oil, oil tankers, and that mm. he's trying to set up some insurance, domestic insurance mechanism, is mm. a way for him to try to circumvent uh, the sanctions that we have imposed. I, I think that yes. another problem is, is that they have uh, such a partner as Turkey. Mm -hmm. So they help them very, very, really much. And it's, it does not give us good uh, uh, success. So I think um, uh, how we could, uh, we could make our sanction policy better. Well, any, it's something that political leaders have to think through. 
but any pressure that the US, the UK, the European Union, um, the Australians, Canada, of course, can put on all the other players will matter because in, in a system, if you have, you know, exit doors or back doors through which you can escape the main sanctions, of course, it weakens the system. So I don't know whether through, um, you know, through NATO, um, Turkey can be put under pressure, but that one, that's mm. one avenue. Turkey mm. is playing a funny game because, you know, by, by blocking or announcing that they will block Sweden and Finland, of course, mm. they put themselves in that good bargaining position. And it's difficult to put very much pressure on them when you ask them to vote for Sweden and Finland. Mm. But it's all the, you know, all the countries of goodwill, the coalition of the willing to support Ukraine that have to really put other other countries under pressure. There will be, you know, there will be a G20 in India coming up soon for the finance uh, ministers and the central bank governors. And I think it would be a good occasion to remind all the other G20 leaders of their duty for peace and their duty for stability, because if they don't respect those rules, then stability uh, is an issue. I think that it's not a good uh, game for Turkey, especially. And by the way, I just want to ask you, what is how, how is your opinion? Who has a worse situation uh, among the EU countries now? Who had uh, suffered more? Yeah, if, if I look at uh, if I look at my inflation numbers, which is the barometer that I use, the countries that are closest to Russia, surprise, surprise, like the Baltic countries, mm. are taking a huge big hit because they were trading partners, because there is a political risk that is associated with them. So they are the ones that have the worst uh, numbers. If you look at you know debt uh, to GDP. Mm. A country like Greece is mm. at risk, but it's not a big risk because a lot of their uh, borrowing is with uh, quasi-official uh, institutions like the European Stability Mechanism. The other country that has a high debt to GDP is Italy, of course. So I'm, I'm the... also worried. So you, it's a half of our loans is uh, uh, the US loans and uh, Half is fifty persons is this is uh, from eurozone, so it's also mm. impact on uh, um, currency rates. And my question is, what is the maximum inflation uh, you see in Europe this year? Hmm. You know, ev everything has been a surprise uh, in terms of uh, economic projections, in terms of inflation. So it's it's hard for me to say, but. The official projections that we have put inflation at around 7% for 23. And I will have to double check the numbers because I think I'm, I'm giving you mm -hmm. a number which is a bit on the low side. It's, it's probably a little mm -hmm. higher than that. At this time, I think it's uh, pretty hard to have uh, right forecasts. You know, that situation is uh, <laughs> going uh, unstable. So, so do you think, is it possible to increase uh, uh, to increase um, rates uh, to four persons uh, for ECB. But that, that you know, I wish I could tell you. I wish I had a crystal ball to say that, but I, I, I cannot um, say so for you know at this point in time. It's going to be a factor of impact of our action, mm -hmm. level of inflation. Scope, you know, does it apply only to energy? Is it food? Is it services? Is it we have multiple ways to measure inflation? What I know mm. is that it will interest rates will continue to rise inevitably. Mm. But up mm. to what point? What will be the terminal rate? When will we reach the terminal rate? That I cannot tell you. I don't know. My my economist. Now, my yeah. economist said my economist said that in negative uh, forecast interest rates uh, in ecb could reach 4% as as i told you i i do not have currently a terminal rate nor a time when we reach terminal rate the only thing i can tell you and the economists who are advising you and i'm sure that they are as 
competent and as honest as my economist is that it needs to go higher than where we are at the moment because mm -hmm. otherwise we will not manage to tame inflation and the question is uh, how do you think um, uh, what is your colleagues from uh, fit uh, think about that do you mm -hmm. have a conversation with them we not only yeah we do of course have conversations we exchange a lot and actually i will be seeing uh, jay powell tonight we have dinner tonight mm. um we have a meeting of the um bank of international settlement in basel and i'm having dinner with him tonight so yes we do talk a lot but you know president whatever is the coming out of this situation who wins who loses in a way is irrelevant. What matters is that Ukraine, at the end of the day, wins. Mm -hmm. So and I take the very, the very simple view that those who have the biggest gun at the end of the day win, right? Mm -hmm. This is a very stupid, basic uh, Wild West cowboy principle. Mm -hmm. It is the mm -hmm. case at the moment that the biggest military power in the world is the United States. So the mm. United States is supplying the biggest shipment of weapons, is mm. providing a very large amount of funding, and that's the reality that we deal with. And mm. I don't think that we can just um, argue about who wins, who loses. It's you who has to win, and we have to make every effort we can to support you. Okay, let let's stop to talk about. Uh... Let's stop to talk about sad things. I'm really glad to see you, and I see you, uh, and I'm glad to see a smart, a smart woman at this position. And I think that you're pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'm, I, have, well, I have a question I'm, about. Yeah. I'm I'm also a good um, user of uh, electronic money. So my question, uh, you're in introducing the electronic euro, as I know. Yeah. So yeah. How, can I, um, how can switching to an electronic currency help? Well, two things. Number one, it will be decided in October. So we are preparing the ground. We want to be ready. Um, we want to be trained, but it will not be decided until October 23. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm personally convinced that we have to move ahead is a situation like the one we are in now. We are mm -hmm. dependent on the supply of gas by a, a very unfriendly country. Mm -hmm. I don't want Europe to be dependent on an unfriendly country's currency. For instance, I don't know, you know, the Chinese currency, the Russian currency, the mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. or dependent on a friendly currency, but which is activated by a private corporate entity like, you know, Facebook or like uh, Google or anybody like. I'm a user of Bitcoin too. So I had bought it uh, when it started and uh, I, I hope that uh, it also will work in through the special system. And uh, I know there are many protests in Europe uh, against uh, the electronic euro. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the reason? You know, it's, it's the beauty of Europe. It has different uh, positions. If you ask in Northern Europe, for instance, uh, in the Netherlands, they're quite happy to see the e-euro coming. If mm. you ask a young German um man you'll say yeah fine mm. as i said i don't want meta google or amazon to suddenly come up with a currency that would take over the sovereignty of europe i don't want a foreign currency to become the currency of trading within europe so we have to be ready no the problem is they don't want to be controlled uh, they don't want to uh yeah but you know what you know what <laughs> Now we have in Europe this threshold above 1,000 euros, you cannot pay cash. If you do, mm -hmm. you are on the gray market. So you take mm -hmm. your risk. You get caught, you are fined, or you go in jail. But, you know, the, 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 
digital euro is going to have a limited amount of control. There will be control. You're right. You're completely right. Mm -hmm. We are considering whether for very small amounts, you know, anything that is around 300, 400 euros, we could have a mechanism where there is zero control. But that could be dangerous. The terrorist attacks on France uh, back uh, 10 years ago were entirely financed by those very small anonymous credit cards that you can recharge in total anonymity. Mm -hmm. The uh, you know that the um, uh, question is now now I think that it's a joke like like a joke that the next um, uh, currency will be firewood for Europe. Will be what? Firewood, firewood. To hit, to hit the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's like a joke. It's like a joke from uh, Russian side. That well, they we... can get lost. <laughs> and my question is: Do you think that the policy uh, of previous authorities uh, with the IMF, I mean Poroshenko, led to a crisis? Because I got uh, many big, uh, many uh, terrible uh, situation in economics when I became a president. So because uh, he uh, probably has uh, stole some um, some loans for Ukraine for his interests, and uh, we forced it to raise the pensions and tariffs for a long time, and it, it led to the critical situation, and Russia used it. Hmm. You know, I think, first of all, I think the IMF did the best that it could do to help and support Ukraine. Um, you know, as well as I do, that the country was not in perfect shape. Uh, you know, as well as I do, that there were some, some very strange characters who abused the situation, who had their own militias, who had their own system that certainly took advantage of what was... Um, tried both by the IMF, by the United States, in order to help Ukraine. But, you know, you cannot rewrite history. And I think mm. that at the time, the loan by the IMF, the program that was initiated, was necessary and had it not happened, would have been devastating for Ukraine. So was it 100% well implemented? Certainly not. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. I'm really Thank happy you, to you. talk to you. Thank you. Have Same a great here. day with your colleagues. You too. Okay. Thank you. Move on and let's go.